Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Dissecting the Diagnostic Yield of Exome Sequencing. I'm Bob Woodard, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I have a couple of important announcements. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to submit questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the left. Thank you. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Deanna Church. Dr. Church is the Senior Director of Genomics and Content at Personalis Incorporated, a clinical genome diagnostics company located in Menlo Park, California. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Church. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Bob. And I'd like to thank everyone for taking time to join today to um, listen to this presentation. And first of all, I would like to start off by thanking several of the individuals who have either contributed data to this presentation or contributed very important ideas in terms of thinking about how we improve our process and, and the kinds of experiments that we want to do. I'd also like to give you a little more background about who we are. So as Bob mentioned, we're a small uh, clinical diagnostics company located in Menlo Park, California. And we actually offer services in both inherited disease diagnostics as well as in cancer and general research services. And we can offer these services either on research basis or in our CLIA and CAP accredited laboratory. And what's important to remember about all of these products is they all set on top of what we call our ACE platform. And so the ACE platform is really designed to help us solve key accuracy issues that we observe in the genomics diagnostic space. And what this really means is we've sort of broken down the process of sequencing the informatics, the annotation, and the interpretation, try to identify key problematic areas in each of these regions and try to improve those to build an integrated platform to improve diagnostic yield and, and accuracy. So when we think about that, you know, there's a lot of different things that we think about that go into each of these steps. But today I'm going to focus on four key areas. First, we're going to talk a little bit about assay development. We're then going to talk about how we might assay, how, assess how that assay is performing. We're going to talk about the importance of variant identification and accurate variant identification, as well as the annotation of those variants once we have identified them. But before we actually start talking about these four areas, I'd like to take a step back and really sort of explain what we think and, and what we mean by diagnostic yield because it's a little bit different thinking about this in a clinical setting versus a research setting. And so when we think about diagnostic yield, what we're really thinking about is what variants can we return to an ordering physician to help them inform patient care? So this is not just an interesting variant that we might find that looks like it could be causative or looks like it may be involved in disease. We really think there has to be very strong evidence to support this case. And this evidence is really predicated by guidelines from um, resources such as the American College of Medical Genetics. And in this next slide, what I'm showing you is this matrix of evidence that they've put together that allow us to come up with criteria by which we can define whether a variant is likely to be pathogenic and affecting a patient's disease or not. So I think you know, it's very important to think about the, the complexity of this process, but it's also important for us to think about the fact that the idea of genomic testing is not new. And so one of the things that we also want to think about is what kind of diagnostic yield should we be expecting? And so this is just to remind everyone that we've really been doing genomic-based diagnostics since we could identify chromosomes under a microscope. And really the first test we could start developing when we realized that an additional chromosome 21 led to Down syndrome. And for many, many years, karyotyping was the first line genomic test that were performed on individuals that presented with generalized developmental delay. And in general, the diagnostic yield on this test is roughly three to 5%. Now, as technology improves and becomes more precise, 
what we can see is a moderate increase in that diagnostic yield. So as um, molecular technologies such as fish um, were developed where we could probe specific areas of the genome, we saw an increase in the diagnostic yield. And then as technology improved and we began to enter the genome area, we could do more and more precise tests, again, leading to an increase in diagnostic yield. So here we see using uh, techniques such as uh, CGH array, either back arrays or oligo arrays, which are more in practice now, we can see an additional increase in diagnostic yield. Although again, these are, I, these are typically identifying relatively large events as opposed to, you know, single nucleotide variants. Now, while many of these large scale genomic techniques were being developed, there was also what I often refer to as this sort of golden age of positional cloning. So really prior to uh, the availability of a reference assembly, we were able to do positional cloning and identify variants in genes leading to very common Mendelian diseases. And so this just shows a, a timeline of the identification of some of these uh, disorders. And so as the variants and disease associations were being made, genetic testing were, that was actually developed to go alongside of this. And, and much of this happened really well before we had a well-developed reference assembly and could do large scale sequencing which has led to the, to the type of testing that is still very common today, which is the notion of doing either single gene sequencing or now more commonly gene panels, which may assay five to 20 to several hundred genes that may be associated with a specific phenotype or spectrum of phenotypes. And so if we want to really look at what the diagnostic yield on gene panels are, one of the things that we see is in fact that this diagnostic yield varies wildly. So we see on the low end, the diagnostic yield may be as low as 10%, and on the high end, it starts to approach 100%. And the two things that really affect how, what your diagnostic yield will be are the specificity of the phenotype. So how, how specific a phenotype do you have on that individual? And what is the genetic heterogeneity of the disease? That is how many genes may lead to that phenotype when they are disrupted. And so we can see there's really quite a yield depending upon that. Now, what we don't often think about in terms of thinking about this diagnostic yield, but clearly also affect our ability to do a gene to disease association are things like reduced penetrance or variable expressivity. So when we want to start looking at things like exome sequencing and understand what the diagnostic yield in that realm is, what I can show you here is the diagnostic yield that we see in our own laboratory. So currently when we perform a clinical exome test, we are able to return a result to a position approximately 48% of the time. Now to compare to recently published work um, on 2000 exomes, we see that on average, the diagnostic yield there is about 25%. And a recent paper actually looking at mouse strains showed a diagnostic yield of about 53%. Although I think this is an interesting case because in the, the example of the mouse study, in many cases, they had identified the area of the genome in which they were interested in looking. So they were able to reduce their search space, which is very helpful in terms of trying to identify um, what, you're, what you're looking for. If we look more carefully at the breakdown of this, I think it's also important to remember that when we think about something that we return to a position, it's not necessarily the case that every variant we return has a, a clinical assertion of pathogenicity. So we can see it in over 65% of the time that is in fact, we return something that's pathogenic or likely pathogenic that's in a gene that is well associated with a phenotype. So this is a really strong case. But then there are other cases where we might return a gene, a variant of uncertain significance. And it may be in a gene in which there's a very good association between gene to phenotype, but we may be uncertain of what the effect of this variant is. In other cases, we might see a case where uh, the, the individual gives us an unusual presentation of a disorder. So what we might be seeing is an ex expanded phenotypic spectrum of this disorder. Um, in other cases, we have seen, we've seen individuals where we think there's reduced penetrance. And then lastly, and this is a very common thing in the exome field, as we are also now able to assay more of the genome than we have before, is we might return variants in what we consider an emerging disease area. And what this means is that there are less than three families that provide evidence for this gene to disease association. So maybe not as strong as evidence as we might like, but surely, but clearly um, su subjective. Um, so we think these are pretty strong criteria for returning to physicians. But one of the things that we really want to focus on is how do we reduce this negative number? 
because what we really would like to be able to do is give these physicians very informative information so they can have a positive impact on their patients' outcomes. And so what the rest of the talk I'm going to focus on how we think about reducing that negative number by increasing accuracy. And so the first thing I'll talk about is our approach to assay development. Now, typically, when I start talking about this, people often start having an argument about, well, really, should you be doing genomes in a clinical setting or should you be doing exomes in a clinical setting? And then that also turns to, well, should you be doing panels in a clinical setting or should you be doing exomes in a clinical setting? And people have very, very strong opinions about this and, and will have what are almost religious type arguments about which of these assays is better. But I would actually assert to you that these are not actual specific assays, but rather, you know, whether you're using the term whole genome or whole exome or panel, these are really umbrella terms for an assay. So in this slide, we'll sort of demonstrate what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about here, which is so in this area up here, what we have is the genome sort of boxed out in different types of, of um, annotated regions that you might be interested in. So CDS is in UTRs, other regions of the genome that might be interpretable, um, biologically annotated regions, and then the rest of the genome that we don't really have a good idea of what's going on, obviously not drawn to scale. And so classically, especially as this high throughput, low cost sequencing was developed, people would consider a whole genome something that assessed all of these regions, although we know in fact that, this is, that, that we can't have access to the entire genome. And then the classic exome, when there was really only one or two products in the, in the world, really focused largely on the coding sequences. And then we still had our classical Sanger panels, which was really focused on assessing the coding sequence of a very small number of genes with a strong association to a phenotype. But as we've learned more about doing this kind of analysis, we've actually expanded our range of products and approaches to trying to assay the genome. And so now there are many uh, products out there labeled exome that actually cover both the CDSs and the UTRs. Additionally, we've now moved into the realm of what we call the augmented exome. And what we really mean by that is we're actually not really just targeting the exonic areas. We're really trying to identify what we would consider the medically interpretable part of the genome to try and assay that with very high fidelity. And you can think about doing that both at the exome level as well as the panel level. And so what I would really encourage you to think about is that you don't want to think about an assay as being whole genome or whole exome, but you really want to understand the specifics of that assay. And you really want to understand the question it is that you want to ask. So in many cases, it might be very important for you to assay the whole genome. And so you want something that's going to try and do that. Whereas in other cases, you might want to make sure that you're covering specific parts of the genome with very high fidelity and confidence, and that's what you really care about. So you really need to understand the performance of your assay. So our approach has actually been focused on trying to identify what we would consider the medically important part of the genome. And we do this by having a complex integration system from a lot of different resources to identify um, variants and genes that might be important in Mendelian disease or cancer or pharmacogenomics to try and make sure that we can assay these with high fidelity. We then take what might be considered a standard exome and we augment that to make sure that we can cover these medically important regions as demonstrated by the additional green probes that we might add to make sure that we cover regions both that are important and medically important genes as well as regions outside of those genes. We've taken a similar approach with our cancer platform, which has been able to build upon this approach of really targeting the specific regions of the genome that we want to look at by also developing tumor assays that allow us to assay specific fusion events or specific RNA events that allow us to provide a better out information for people in the cancer diagnostic space. So we've talked a little bit about how you might think about developing an assay and thinking about an assay. But now once you've picked the assay that you want to use for your clinical or research question, you really need a good way to assess the performance of that assay. Now one metric, and it's certainly not the only metric, but one metric that we use is what we consider gene finishing or coverage. Now one of the, the terms that you might hear consistently is that we sequence this genome at 120x or, or this exome at 120x or this genome at 30x. 
And what that really means is on average, every base that was targeted is sequenced to that, to that coverage. But in practice, that's not really what happens because what we can see here, this is 30X whole genome sequencing. And what I'm showing you is a coverage plot. So what we've done in the X axis is we've removed the introns from the genes and we're just showing the, the exonic regions of the gene. In dark blue, we're showing a standard deviation below average. And in light blue, it's a standard deviation above average. And so what we can see is actually wild variability. So even though on average this genome was covered at 30x, we see regions in these medically important genes that either have no coverage or they might have wildly variable coverage. So they perform very different from assay to assay. And so if you're in a clinical setting and you want to make sure that you're covering clinically important genes fully, then you need to do something to help improve this outcome. I think another important thing in terms of thinking about what assay you're looking at is really understanding how these different assays perform using this metric. And so what we show here is on the x-axis, we're showing the percent bases with greater than 20x local coverage, and that's for Q20 bases. And on the y-axis, we're showing percent finished exons. And what we're really looking here are at are roughly the 8,000 what we would consider medically interpretable genes. And here we have the labels for each of these assays. Now, one of the things that I hope is, is clear to people is that we have several assays here that would be labeled an exome that are all uniformly performing better than a whole genome using this particular metric of coverage and another exome that is also performing better than whole genome at this very high end of looking at 100% coverage. But the other thing that's important is all these things that are labeled exome also have very different performance characteristics. And this is why it's really important when you're looking at the assay that you want to use for your clinical or research question, that you understand the performance metrics of that assay and understand how you want to assess that. This is sort of another way of looking at this problem. And this is data that we were gotten from Rachel Goldfeder in and Ashley's lab where she's been really specifically looking at the ACMG genes. So this is a list of genes for which the ACMG recommends reporting secondary findings when you're doing an exome analysis on a patient. And so these are considered very important medical genes. And so you would want to make sure that you have very good coverage of these genes. And so what we show here is a personalis ACE exome and a Baylor ACE exome, as well as two different whole genome analyses. And what you can see is that as you go down this list, the number of bases that might be missed in these assays continues to grow. I think this is a pretty important thing to look at as well in that two assays that are nominally considered whole genome assays can still have very different performance characteristics. And so just saying that somebody is doing whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing is just not sufficient. Understanding how you're covering the content of, that you care about is what's really important regardless of the assay type that you choose. So why do we think this is important? So we've seen examples of this in our own clinical lab. And so I'll walk you through a case very briefly that we worked on here. And so this was a case of a family with two uh, sons that presented with infantile onset retinitis pigmentosa. They had high myopia and there was no family history of this. Now they had had prior gene testing. So a 13 gene autosomal recessive retinitis pigmentosa family. So they were sent to us for exome sequencing. And so one of the things that's very interesting in this case is that we know that approximately 80% of X-linked retinitis pigmentosa is caused by mutations in the RPGR gene. And so what I show here again is this coverage plot that I showed you earlier. So here we see coverage using a standard exome. And this is on average, the red line here represents 20X coverage. The dark blue again shows one standard deviation below the mean. And this is just a representation of the gene RPGR3 at below that. And so what you can see in the red circles are regions where you either have no coverage or where you have highly variable coverage. Now, one of the mis misconceptions I think that people think about in terms of genome sequencing is that if you have regions that aren't well covered at say 30X, 
that all you really need to do is sequence higher to try and get those coverage. And that's absolutely not true. So here's the same gene and same plot, coverage plot, but now it's been sequenced to well over 100x coverage. And what you can hopefully see is that these same problematic regions are still not covered well. And the reason for this is that this lack of coverage is not due to just stochastic variation, but there's actually genomic uh, architecture here that makes assessment of this region problematic. And this is where our approach to doing specific assay development can help fill in these regions. And so when we look at performance of this gene using the ACE exome, what we can see is now these regions that are not well covered in the standard exome now are very well covered in the augmented exome. And this becomes even more important when it, we see, look at our patient with a variant exactly in this region. And this is in fact where most of the causative variants for RPGR cluster. So being able to cover this region with high fidelity is really critical to understanding the influence of RPGR in retinitis pigmentosa and how these might affect patient outcomes. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about actual variant identification. So you've got good assay development and, you, and you're, you're doing your sequencing. And now we need to think about variant identification and how we're going to call these variants. So one thing that I tend to think about a lot is not just the algorithms for doing the alignments or the calling, but really how does the reference assembly influence your ability to identify variants? So I'm showing you here as a cartoon example where we have a sample that has gene one, and gene two, but our reference assembly, so the assembly that we're gonna use for analysis only contains gene one. Now, the way that most people tend to think about this is, well, I'll be able to analyze gene one, but I might not be able to analyze gene two. And I think the problem with that is that that is actually the best case scenario. Because if gene two is related to gene one in any way, you might start seeing reads that are derived from this gene two locus recruited and aligned to the gene one locus in your reference assembly. Now, if this, this can sort of lead to two different outcomes. So if these alignments really become very messy, what it may mean is that you just don't call any variants in this region because your aligners and, and variant callers are just gonna throw up their hands because they're not gonna know what to do with the alignments. However, if gene two is really highly related to gene one, what you might start seeing is that you might start making variant calls based on the alignments of the blue reads, not the green reads, leading to false positive variant calls because what you're actually identifying are paralogous sequence differences between gene one and gene two, rather than the allelic variation between the two copies of gene one that you're interested in. We know that this is more than a theoretical um, observation. So we have taken sequence that we know was not present in GRCH37, which is the, the uh, previous version of the reference assembly and probably the version of the reference assembly that most people are still using. So we took these novel sequences, decomposed these into reads, and then we aligned those back to GRCH37. And we did this using four different alignment methods. And what we saw was that really only about a third of the reads did not align to the reference assembly in this case. But in fact, about two thirds of them, regardless of the alignment method, found an off-target alignment, suggesting the importance of the reference assembly in getting accurate alignments thus, and, and improved variant calls. So now with that being said, we'll also talk a little bit about GRCH38. I know this is, a, this is the mo more recent version of the reference assembly and, and something that often strikes fear in the heart of many because trying to transform from one reference assembly from, to another can be quite challenging. But I think it's instructive to sort of think about some of the differences between GRCH37 and GRCH38. And then later on, I'll also talk to you a little bit about how we might be able to use some of the information in GRCH38 to inform our analysis of 37 um, while we work on that transition. But I'll just walk you through one example that sort of exemplifies some of the difficulties in using GRCH38 and some of the things that we fix that were problems in GRCH37. And so this is a region on chromosome 17, contains the gene family CCL3. And these blue lines represent the clone tiling path that was used to construct the chromosome assembly here. 
So we can see this region right here contains a large gap. This track here, ah, sorry, this track here are gene annotation. This track here is ClinVar and this track here is DBSNP. So one of the things that we learned from research from other groups is that the, geno the genomic organization of this region, MGRCH37, probably doesn't exist in anyone because there's a known polymorphism in this region such that an individual can have zero to four copies of a 90 KB repeat. So this gap that we see here is actually false gap and we have two different alleles in series. And when we zoom in, so this box highlights part of the gene family here, understanding getting the genotype of this region right is important because there have been some associations, although these are a little bit uh, controversial right now, that possibly copy number of genes in this region might affect your ability to become infected with HIV. Now, I would assert that perhaps one of the reasons that the association here is somewhat controversial is that if you want to do genotype to phenotype associations, it's really important to get the genotype correct, and we have not done that in this case. And I'm sure that's leading to some confounding problems in the analysis. So what we were able to do was take advantage of the availability of a single haplotype resource derived from a hydidiform mole. So a hydidiform mole is the uh, product of conception when a sperm fertilizes an enucleated egg. There are several rounds of cell division leading to a molar pregnancy, which is then terminated. But that resource now is based on a single sperm and is a single haplotype. So this single haplotype resource we have, CHM1, has been well described in this publication by Steinberg et al. But it's also been a very valuable resource because in addition to having whole genome data from this resource, we also have fact data. And we were able to take complicated regions, such as the CCL region, and actually build a back tiling path that we know is based on one single haplotype. And when we did that, we, we learned that the CHM1 resource had a complete deletion allele of this region. And we thought that was unfortunate and wanted to at least be able to represent one representation of the insertion. And so we actually had availability of that from the original donor and the original assembly. And so what I'm showing you here is what we call an alternate locus. So this is an alternate representation of the CCL3 region. It's represented as this roughly 325 KD contig. And what I'm showing you here is this sequence with its gene annotation and an alignment to chromosome 17. So in these alignment pictures where you see complete gray like this, there's a perfect match. These red lines indicate mismatches. And this thin line is a region where there is no alignment. So this region here demonstrates se sequence that is available only on the alternate locus and not on the chromosome assembly. And so just to put this more in global perspective, these purple triangles show regions in the genome for which these alternate sequence representations are available. And so what this really means is there is still a chromosome assembly and while some of the chromosomes may have gaps, we have sequence, you know, from the, from the telomere to telomere with gaps included. But regions where there's excessive diversity, there might be an additional sequence that has been instantiated as a FASTA sequence and then aligned back to the chromosome that is also available for analysis. And so when you collectively look at all of these green triangles, what we see is that there is 3.6 megabases of sequence in these alternate loci that is not available in the chromosome sequence. And there's 153 unique genes. This graph here shows the amount of unique sequence per alternate locus. So what this shows is that these are actually not homogeneous at all. The vast majority of the alternate loci contribute less than 50 KB of unique sequence but some of them contribute all the way out to 350 KB of unique sequence. So these are very important and diverse sequences that are adding additional diversity that allow us to represent better the human population. But there's a lot of difficulty in using these sequences. And so I have a couple of, of examples just to show you here. 
And a lot of this has to do with the algorithms that have been developed for doing genome analysis. Because these algorithms have largely been developed based on the notion that the reference assembly is represented by a single haploid representation. And so if you end up with a sequence read, like these reads in purple here, that align to more than one location, the map quality of these reads is going to be decreased. And that is rightfully so, because we actually don't know which of these loci this read derives from. But now, when we introduce the concept of an alt locus, so here I show a cartoon of an alt locus aligned back to the chromosome sequence, and here we see the unique sequence, now we see this read, which is unique with respect to the primary, now also has a secondary location. And so most of our read aligners that have been tuned to try and down map or down map quality reads derived from paralogously duplicated sequence cannot distinguish now this paralogous duplication from the allelic duplication that's introduced by the alternate locus. And so there is a significant need for tool development in order to allow us to take full advantage of the GRCH38 assembly. I would say additionally, there are challenges with variant representation. So even if we do have alignments that we can interpret to the primary and the alternate locus, most of the very calling tools are also expecting a haploid reference. And so if there is a difference between your read, which may be a C, and your alt locus, which may be a G, there's likely going to be a genotype call of 1-1 because they're going to be called homozygous with respect to the alternate locus, when in fact a variant at the alternate locus could be hemizygous if your sample contains both the rep sequence representation found on the primary as well as the sequence representation found on the alt. So it really underscores this importance of being able to go back in and do really pretty robust genotype reconstruction of your sample in order to really robustly characterize some of these very, very complex regions that we have in our genome. Now, I hope many of you have heard of the global alignments and this move towards trying to have a graph-based representation. And so what this means is instead of having this flat haploid representation, we could actually take all of the variation we know about and represent it in a single structure and have access to this at all one time. And there are a lot of really, you know, really smart people working on this, but it's going to take a little bit of effort and time to build up the, both the data models as well as the infrastructure and tools to use these structures. And I would assert, in fact, that thinking about approaches that allow us to use the alternate loci as they exist in GRCH38 today become important. And I'll demonstrate that th with this one relatively simple slide, where all I did was I took all of the genes annotated in the NCBI annotation 105, and I looked and I said, well, how many of those genes overlap an alternate locus? And that number is roughly 5%. But if I just look at the medically interpretable genes, so the roughly 25% that we consider medically relevant, we actually now see about 6.4% of those genes are in these regions where there's alternate loci. So this really underscores the fact that these regions where there's extreme complexity and diversity are not medically uninteresting at all. And in fact, they contain many medically relevant genes such as the MHC or the cure locus. So one approach that we've taken to try and investigate this and see if there's a way that we can, can get access to some of the new data in 38 is to use sequences that the GRC released that are called fixed patches. And so this, again, underscores the, 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 the things I'm going to talk to you about now are not in production. These are just sort of research that we have been doing on the side to see how improving the reference assembly improves your ability to do variant calls. And this karyotypic representation, all of the orange dots that you see are regions where the GRC released a fixed patch. So operationally, this looks like an alt locus. So they just release a contig sequence that aligns back to the chromosome except rather than representing diversity, like what you see in the novel patches in the alt loci, these represent regions where the underlying chromosome assembly is incorrect and the fixed patch provides a correct representation of that region. And so the approach that we take is as follows. So what I show here 
This blue line represents a fixed patch at the shank two locus. So shank two is a medically important gene thought to be associated with autism. And again, I show you another alignment track. So we see this is the alignment to chromosome 11 where the shank two gene is. And we can see for the most part, this is a very good alignment. There are no mismatches. But what we do see here is this one little poor region. And this is a region where there's no sequence in the chromosome representation, but we have sequence on this fixed patch. And this sequence actually contains two coding exons. So if you are using GRCH37 and you're trying to analyze shank 2 you're actually missing these two coding exons that you only have access to either in GRCH38 or by using the fixed patch. So the approach that we take, here's the chromosome representation, here is the fixed patch representation, and we can just redact the chromosome representation. So we force reads to align to the fixed patch, and this gets us around this problem of the allelic duplication that's introduced by these alternate sequences. We can then take this data and, and do alignment and read calling. And so what I'm showing you here are normalized read plots. So we expect the reads to be right around one. And we show at the top alignment to a fixed patch. And at the bottom alignment to HS37D5 or the thousand genomes version of the reference assembly. And so not surprisingly, there is no sequence alignment here. And we see a nice sequence alignment here. So Getting better alignments in a region of a fixed patch, I think, is not too surprising. But what we can really see that's very exciting is when we look outside of the regions of fixed patches, we can see a generalized improvements. So here, I'm also showing you a normalized read plot. But in this case, we have both plotted on the same plot. The dark blue is from HS37D5, and the green is the fixed patch version of the reference assembly. And so what we see is we go from something that looks a lot like a duplication, in fact, to a nice normalized plot. When we go in and look at the IGV plot for this, what we see when we look at HS37D5 is we see a region with lots of diversity, much, much more than we would expect. And many of these are heterozygous calls. When we now look at this in the fixed patch version, what we see is now a much cleaner alignment with a much more expected representation of SNPs, most of which are homozygous. So we can find 378 such regions where we see a greater than 10 SNB difference between these two calls. Now, this is not just a one-off, although, so we can find other regions where we go from HS37D5, relatively messy looking IGV plots to relatively clean uh, expected SNP diversity but it's not all rainbows and sunshine. So we do see regions in this case where we go from a pretty messy region with excessive variation in HS37D5 to a different representation of excessive variation and excessive heterozygous calls in, in 37P10. So this really goes to show that we have more work to do, but it does underscore the importance that the reference assembly can have in making accurate variant calls. Now, again, we can see the importance of, of really do, being able to perform accurate variant calls when we look at some of the cases that we've seen in our lab. So in this case, we had a family come in with a, a couple of affected kids with intellectual disability and, and some related phenotypes. And when we sequenced them, we actually found that the two offspring had the same variant in GATA d 2 b But when we looked at the GATK genotypes, we saw the same variant in the father, thus in the unaffected father. So leading us to believe if we had not looked at this more deeply that this was not a good variant for this case. But when we were investigating the variant further, you know, GATA D2B was a very good candidate for, for being related in this, this family's disease. And the variant that we found in our family clusters with other variants that have been seen in this, other disease causing variants that have been disease, seen in this disease. So we looked a little bit more closely, and what we found was that even though GATK had determined that the father's genotype was heterozygous, when we looked at the allele ratio, what we can see is that this is way off from what we would expect. So we can see the two children that have a much more expected allele ratio for a heterozygous variant, and the father was much lower, leading us to suspect that, in fact, what the father had was a mosaic variant rather than full allelic. 
when we went in and Sanger validated this, and I apologize for the transformation problem here, we could actually see, because this is an insertion, we can actually see the ghost of the offsets and allow to allow us to confirm that the father was indeed mosaic. Now, I think this underscores both the importance of having very deep sequencing and very accurate sequencing for being able to identify these very low frequency events. And it's becoming very interesting in the Mendelian field to really actually look at the effect of mosaicism and how often mosaicism may actually be playing a part in, in these disorders. So lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about variant annotation. And so one of the things that we have been looking at doing is understanding if we can use GRCH38 to inform our analysis of GRCH37. And so in order to do this, we just align the two assemblies together using, and we're using the NCBI approach for this. And so I want to introduce, introduce you to the concept of two different kinds of alignments when we do these assembly assembly alignments. One of which is what we call a first pass alignment. And these are cases where you get essentially a reciprocal best hit. So these are relatively, you. this is a relatively unique region in the two assemblies. This would be considered a reciprocal best hit. We then go back and we look for regions that are unaligned in each assembly to see if we can find a good alignment. And in this case, where we see a repeat that is expanded in assembly one that's not represented in assembly two, we can recover this alignment. And so when we think about this, if we see a signature where we have a second pass only alignment in an assembly, that's really a signature for an expansion. So we can see a, an expanded related sequence in this assembly. Whereas if we see both a first pass and a second pass alignment, this is a signature for collapse in this assembly. Now, I want to remind everybody that the notion of either collapse or expansion is really not a qualitative term because when we look at the analysis of this in GRC H37 and GRC H38, so 38 is in green, 37 is in blue, we actually see regions in 37, or excuse me, in regions of 38 that look like they are collapsed. We know this is not surprising because we know one of the main problems in 37 was haplotypic expansion. So we would have regions where we might represent two, three, or four alleles in series because structural variation in the region confounded assembly. But it's quite clear that the picture is actually dominated by collapse in 37. So what this suggested was that there was several, uh, there's a large amount of sequence that was missing in 37, but that sequence was related to sequences and other sequences in 37. So these are largely what we consider missing paralogs. We can actually use these alignments to try and, and project the location of features in 37 onto 38. And so I have done this with several commonly used uh, variant sets. And what I want to focus on is the fact that we can identify several thousand of these variants that map to these regions of collapse. Most importantly, I'd like to focus on the variants from ClinVar, where we see 278 variants in ClinVar, and this is from a version of ClinVar last year, that map to these regions of collapse. And in this data set, about 88 of these were had an assertion of pathogenic. So we'll look at one specific example here. We're going to focus on the KCN1 gene. So up top, we have GRCH37. Down below, we have GRCH38. Here we have the gene track. Here we have a alignment of pyrologous sequences. We have our ClinVar track. And then we have predicted pyrologous sequence variants. And the tracks are the same in both 37 and 38 in this diagram. So there's a couple of things to note. So number one, the gene model is actually very different between 37 and 38 as represented by this gray box showing an extended UTR in 37 that's not available in 38. So not only do you have to think about transitioning coordinates, you do have to pay attention to the transcript representations. But luckily, all of our pathogenic variants here are in this exon that is the same between both versions of the assembly. But what we actually see in 38 is now the addition of a paralog that was missing in 37. If we zoom in more closely on this, what we see here is the parent KCN1 gene. This is the gene representation. This is the alignment to the pyrologous sequence. Here we have ClinVar variants, and, and purple on this track means the ClinVar variant is pathogenic. 
Here we have a predicted pyrologous sequence variant. And this predicted pyrologous sequence variant exactly overlaps a predicted pathogenic variant in KCN1. So I think this is an interesting annotation that we can think about now adding to this variant because we really need to go back and understand the analytical validity and understand how these variants were called, which is somewhat problematic because most of the variants in DD-SNP we don't really have the evidence for. But we'd want to go back and do due diligence to make sure any variant calls in this region are actually allelic and not pyrologous, as this region is prone to, to identifying pyrologous sequence variants. Lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about variant representation because it's not just being able to annotate. Part of, part of the issue of annotating a variant is being able to match it to other variants that you've seen before. And there are two problems with this. One of which is that there are multiple ways to represent a variant in a VCF file. So VCF is the common genomics structure used to represent variants in, when you're doing large-scale genome analysis. And this figure is taken from a recent paper from Adrian Tan and his colleagues showing how the same variant can have multiple representations in a VCF. So this is one thing that complicates variant matching just on a, on a normal scale. But we have an additional problem in terms of thinking about how we intersect clinic, historical clinical data with the new genomics data that we're generating now. And I'll use an example that should be well known to most people, which is the Delta F508 variant in CFTR. So in this graphic, we have the CFTR gene and the Delta F508 in the bottom. And if we look at this more closely, we can see that there are two potential mechanisms that would mediate this change. You could look at deleting this TCT or this CTT. And if we look in dbSNP, what we find is both representations. So we see this RSID is associated with the clinical information and the ClinVar record. But what's moderately surprising here is there's no allele frequency information associated with this variant, which is surprising as you would expect to find this variant within the thousand genomes data as the Delta F508 is a founder mutation and is at a very low frequency in the normal population. But if we look more closely in dbSNP, we do see a representation. Now we see the TCT variant as reported by thousand genomes. So we actually can get the allele frequency, but none of the clinical information is associated with this. And if you want to annotate this variant fully, you'd really want both the allele frequency information as well as any information known about the pathogenicity or information from ClinVar. To show you this on a more genome sort of scale, here we have a, a, a similar representation to what I've been showing you before. So here's the chromosome assembly. This is the gene annotation. Here is our ClinVar track. And here is our dbSNP track. And so what we can see this guy right here is our thousand genomes version of our variant. And this guy right here is our ClinVar representation of this variant. And the reason for this discrepancy is because there are different standards in the genomic world versus the clinical world. And this sort of harkens back to this day that, you know, back when most of the, the gene-based testing was actually transcript-based, not genomics-based. So I pointed out earlier that there had been a, a time when we did gene to disease association really at the transcript level. And so that standard developed a notion where if you had an insertion deletion variant, you would shift it as far to the right as possible with respect to the transcript. Whereas the VCF standard has developed to be left shifted with respect to the genome. Now, I have heard many people say, well, can't we just left, you know, can't we just right shift VCF? But that's not going to solve the problem because the HGDS standard is with respect to the transcript. And so since about half your transcripts are on the plus side and half your transcripts are on the, the negative strand, your VCF is going to be shifted wrong half the time regardless of what your standard is. So in terms of thinking about how you integrate this data, you have to take that into account so that you can really get the best annotation possible. There are other cases where this gets even more complicated. So here we see a, a variant that was reported in 1996 describing this insertion in the ATM gene. And, you know, this is somewhat problematic, in fact, because it'd be nicer to know what specific transcript was used because it's a very transcriptionally com complex gene. Luckily, this was a paper that occurred long enough ago where we actually put sequences into papers because that was the speed with which we could do things back then. So I was able to blast this sequence and 
and actually identify where this insertion was, this demonstrates that the reference, the reference sequence has changed because this was originally reported to be between exons 40 and 41, and now it's between exons 38 and 39, but I still don't know what the exact genetic lesion leading to this is. Now about another hour of curation and digging in our lab discovered that the actual lesion that causes this is a C to G change activating a cryptic splice site causing insertion of this um, intronic sequence into the transcript. And so I think this really underscores the importance of really making sure that we archive our variants at the genomic level so that we can do robust mapping, but does underscore the importance of also trying to retain information about the transcript interpretation because this leads to mechanism. I don't think there's a really a process that I'm aware of that would be able to take this change and predict that it would activate a cryptic splice site. So both levels of information are important, but we have to think about standardizing our representations on genomic sequence for doing this type of matching and annotation. So in conclusion, I'd like to just remind people about what I talked about today. And that is, you know, we really have to think about picking the assay that's best suited to the, address the question that you have, particularly. Regardless, even if somebody tells you they're doing a whole genome assay, you really want to be able to define the genomic intervals that they're doing a very good job on. And this is true of whether it's an exome assay, a genome assay, or a panel assay, because you also want to be able to assess the performance of that assay on the intervals in which you're interested. And we really have a lot of work as a community to think about how we really want to store and represent and normalize variants, both at the genomic level and the transcript level for improved annotation. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Church, for that informative presentation. Uh, before we start the Q&A session, I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit questions in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button in the left, lower left-hand corner of the presentation window. Okay, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. Let's see. Well, so far there are no questions, so uh, I guess if, uh, if uh, anyone has any questions, please just submit them now. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I, here's, here, here they are. Uh, here's a question from Tammy Morish, and uh, her question is, is this region located in a known segmental duplication? I believe this refers to a, uh, a previous slide around slide 47 in the, in the presentation. Um, so I'm not sure if it's around slide 47. Um, so I guess it depends on whether the a uh, questioner is referring to the KCN1 example that I showed where a new paralog was added, or if they're referring to regions where we are adding alternate loci. So I'll try and answer both of those. So with respect to KCN1, I, would, I don't think that was a region of known segmental duplication, and part of that is actually related to the fact that our ability to identify segmental duplications is often somewhat reference biased, although there are reference independent ways of identifying these. But I don't think this was something that was really known and, and, or, or expected by anybody. Now, with respect to the places where we've added alternate loci, these regions are not exclusively known to have segmental duplication, although we do know that, that in many cases where there are uh, large structural variations, there is a very strong association with segmental duplications. So in some cases where we see regions where we've had to add alternate loci, these are actually complicated by the fact that there is also segmental duplications in the, these regions. And so when you're actually assessing the alignments, it can get complicated because 
you know, the novel sequence, the, the so-called novel sequence that you might be adding by the alternate lo loci could actually also be adding new paralogs to things that are on the primary assembly. So in many cases, these regions are very complex. And it's one of the reasons that they both need an alternate sequence representation because there's a lot of, of population diversity there. And it's also why many of them were very difficult to assemble to assemble in the um, in their primary assembly. Uh, I Okay, our next question is from, and I'm going to try this pronunciation, Rajav Arman Kitu from the Cancer Institute. The question is, what is confident levels of variance in hotspot panels which are available in market? Your opinion, please. I have an opinion because I'm not familiar with these products. So, um, I am, I'm sorry, I don't think I can answer your question because I'm not very familiar with these. I would, have to, I would have to know more information about these hotspot panels. Our next question is from Jorge Mendez Rios of the NIH, NIAID. This question is, how good are sequences in the telomeric regions? So that so that's really quite variable. Um, we the the GRC actually worked very closely with Harold Reichman to try and, and complete as many of those as possible. So so some of the regions are some of the subtelomeric regions are in relatively good shape, and others are still somewhat uh, rough, you might say. Um, and it also makes a big difference about whether you're looking at GRC H37 or GRC H38. So there were significant improvements in 38, but one way to get a good idea about how much you can trust either the assembly, either in the subtelomeric regions or in other regions, is when you're looking at whatever your browser of choice is, make sure you tur turn on that track that lets you see how the clones were used to build the assembly. Because if you look in a region and you see there are a lot of gaps in the region, that is a huge indication that there were problems doing the assembly there. And so you might wanna take the ordering there with a little bit of a grain of salt because what the GRC tends to do is they use the evidence that's best available at the time to try and order sequence. But if you see a lot of gaps, it typically means that that evidence might not have been very strong. And so, you know, if you don't see gaps, it doesn't mean there's not a problem. But if you do see gaps, you should definitely be aware. The other source of information that you can use is that the GRC releases a track of issues that they're curating. And this is available in all of the commonly used browsers, so at UCSC and at Ensemble and at NCDI. So you can turn this track on and you can see the regions that the GRC is actively working on and maybe why they're working on them. And so that's another way that you can look to see if a region of the genome that you are particularly interested in may be well assembled or may have problems. So I think we're about out of time. So I'd like to thank everybody for participating and, um, and asking the great questions. And I look forward to hopefully meeting all of you in person one day. Thank you all for attending. Uh, as I, I have a one reminder, or actually an announcement that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for six months from today. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>